Hello there. I'm Tyler Parrott, Senior Game Designer at Fantasy Flight Games, working on Star Wars Unlimited. I'm here to chat about Star Wars. Hello there. General Kenobi. Hello there indeed. It is, in fact, uh, a, a brand new format for what would be the Ice Cave Radio family. Uh, I am Flake, and I'm joined by, as you can already have been informed so politely, it is Tyler Parrott, Senior Game Designer at FFG, handling all of the love that is coming from Star Wars Unlimited, which has come out like a bat out of hell, Tyler. I, I gotta no think... No kidding, you, my God. <laughs> y'all are y'all must be proud as hell. I don't know how else to sort of frame this. I'm frankly shocked. I, it, it's been a couple weeks, and I'm still in shock. <laughs> Well, enjoy these weeks because, like you know, you have been well entwined within the TCG culture uh, for so long, right? And uh, no those origins that we want to dig through, obviously, it's part of your profile. You're a magic player, and uh, you've got some deep TCG roots. But let's hear a little bit about the Tyler Parrot origin story when it comes to card gaming. Sure. Uh, so, uh, fun, fun extra backstory. When I was... Okay, well, fun extra backstory. I do theater. have done theater most of my life. Uh, when I was in middle school, I was at Shakespeare camp in the summer. And we were out in the park. And it was like lunch or something. And some of the kids at the camp had Magic the Gathering cards, and they were playing. And I was watching being like, that's kind of cool. So they taught me. Uh, and then I went and I, me and my buddy who, was, who were there, we learned together. Uh, we went and we bought some pre-constructed decks that just the ones that looked the most exciting, which meant they had the most colors in them. Uh, because at the time, it, at the time Invasion, no, at the time Odyssey block had just come out, uh, which meant that Invasion and Odyssey were the ones that were on the shelves. And Odyssey was weird and bizarre and Invasion was cool and colorful. So we got the Invasion uh, pre-constructed decks. And we mostly didn't know how the game worked. We just played with each other. We would run into keywords and be like, I don't know what this does. What do you think it does? Okay, that's what it does now. Uh, and and we just played kitchen table magic for several years. And as time went on, we're now 22 years later. Uh, and I'm still here. <laughs> Well, the still here part is, uh, I think, underselling it because you're not just still here. You're still here in a capacity that many people, when they're playing card games and become completely enamored with them, to the passion level that you, myself, and, and everybody who sort of uh, really dug into Star Wars U, it's, everybody has this idea of they've got their own card game that they want to design. They want to jump mm -hmm. into it. Now, you have done so. You have uh, essentially sort of transcended into the other side of the fence where you, yes. you you don't necessarily get to critique as much as you get to direct and you get to create. <laughs> um, well, and, don't worry, I get to critique as well. I, just my critiques get acted on. <laughs> Well, that's it. Exactly. You you kind of have the option to sort of you know turn the turn the knobs and and hit the buttons and and play with all the the different knobs and such and all the dials. But at the end of the day, Tyler, there's got to be some influence coming. And and anybody who has a lot of experience within the TCG world um, will see a lot of that influence from other card games moving into where we are now with Star Wars U. You said that you were introduced into Magic, and that's where you sort of cut your teeth in the card game. And we see a little bit about that um, and some of the influence in terms of the play style. And that's not just unique to Star Wars U, obviously. Um, everything is an offshoot of that sort of initial Godfather game way back when, which was Magic the Gathering and, and such. But I have to ask you first. What kind of magic player are you? And some might take <laughs> offense to some of these terms and being a, a called one or the other. But what what kind of magic player are you? Uh, I uh, so um, a related question that people sometimes ask is, "What is your favorite Magic the Gathering card?" Uh, and my my two go to answers are either. Uh, Tide Hollow Sculler and its variants, which for those who don't know, it is a cheap creature that you look at your opponent's hand and you take away one of their cards. And then when they kill the creature, they get the card back. Uh, you might you might know this card as Bodhi Rook. Uh, another card, the, my other favorite card in Magic the Gathering, is the 1-1 Flying Shadowmoor Spirit Token. 
because I love to just very slowly plink people to death. One point of damage at a time over a long period of time or maybe a short period of time if I just get a bunch of tiny flyers that they can't deal with. Uh, I like to just gum up the board with a bunch of little dudes and say, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so you're very much a death by a thousand cuts type of individual. Um, Absolutely. Some might know that 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 first creature that you mentioned as, uh, I think it's like it got a similar reprint recently, like as a cave bat or something oh, along bad, those yeah. lines. Yeah. And that is one of the best limited cards in that particular set. Uh, ultimately, though, the inspiration for not just some of the card designs like you mentioned Bodhi Rook it's something that you've seen before but your Twitter account your X account or whatever you want to call it is very much um, littered with very informative creative processes in terms of where card designs came from and where we're at today but I want to ask you a little bit about Twin Suns versus Commander when it comes to the communities surrounding certain card games specifically Magic the Gathering Commander is the pinnacle now it's kind of like the focal point it's what most people play and not to say that the others are necessarily suffering to the point of death but when it came to creating and perfecting twin sons how much of commander was part of that process of saying let's take this from that let's remove this let's go from there or was twin sons more of a just be, like create it from from nothing straight from scratch uh twin sons came from the the prompt, if you will, of we want to launch the game with a four player free for all multiplayer format. And we want that four player free for all multiplayer format to be uh, significantly different from the regular game mode, that it provides a new play experience, that it caters to a, a different demographic of the audience. Uh, and uh, however, a lot of the things that make Commander so popular in the first place were things that we put in the base game. There's a reason that your deck is built around a character, right? Um, and so we didn't start from how can we make Commander in Unlimited because a lot of the selling points of Commander were already in Unlimited. Um, the thing that we started with uh, first was just how do you make four-player free-for-all multiplayer work at all? Um, and then from there, what's the twist that we can add? Um, and the twist that we could add, which we kind of almost stumbled to on accident, uh, I was mostly not involved in the development of or the design or the development of Twin Suns for context, um, was, that, was the idea of two leaders. Uh, it meant that the cards that you that went in it means you could fundamentally build a deck that didn't exist otherwise uh and um and because we did want it to be singleton um because that was the one piece of commander that we didn't already have in the game that we think uh especially me thinks is important to the identity of a casual first format um, one of the reasons that Commander is so popular is because it's singleton, it means you don't need to collect as many cards, which means it's more accessible to more people. Uh, it means that the games you play are going to be more diverse because you're seeing a wider variety of cards in each game, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the two leaders it, it started as a solution of how do we get more cards in your deck? And then very quickly, as soon as they played one game, everyone was like, oh, no, this is it. Because like, you don't ever get to have two leaders next to each other otherwise at all. This is the unique thing that makes Twin Suns different than regular regular Unlimited. Um, and from there, it was just a a chain of, of cleaning up the loose ends. It always seems like those multiplayer formats, is it, it's a lot about politicking as well, which is a lot of fun, and that's kind of where the casual aspect comes. But you're right. Sometimes it's just about saying... How kind? Of, what kind of crazy nonsense can I sort of cobble mm -hmm. together that is otherwise illegal to do in a competitive format or otherwise just not something that you want to do, not conducive to a winning game plan? 
you know, and that's part of it. That's part of the casual aspect. I've had this conversation a lot with with Charmer or Doa or other people in the community. And when we're talking about Star Wars Unlimited, and a lot of people will always talk about the appeal, the appeal to casuals, the appeal to the competitive scene. I think that there's a gigantic amount for both to be said here, because the competitive people that I know, uh, the pros are already starting to ramp up for Galactic Championships and for the 2025 yes. season. This is... Yes. I, I, Let's go. I, and I'm talking about people who come from all walks of, of TCG life, be it the Runeterra crowd, the the digital crowd in general, the Hearthstone crowd, the magic crowd, the flesh and blood crowd. Everybody is having a look at this from a serious perspective and say that there's so much substance here. But what I want to dive into a little bit more with you, Tyler, is the creative aspect and the casual aspect, because there's so much about this game that is not so much about what is the most optimal play, but what is the coolest play? What is the most yeah. cinematic play? What is the most nostalgic play that I can make that will give me those kinds of feelings? And I want to ask you, when it comes to uh, focusing on casual play, what amount of your design space, that bandwidth in your head, is devoted to also saying, you know what, it's not about optimal scenarios, it's about cool and creative scenarios? Um, It's hard to say, uh, because... On the one hand, our game has a much flatter power level than a lot of other TCGs, uh, right? Like, we don't go out of our way to make the rares better than the commons, for instance. Um, although we do go out of our way to make the unique characters better than the non-unique characters, which there's some correlation there. Um, the main draw for casual is just making the cards and the mechanics easy to learn and fun to play. Uh, it sounds obvious when you say it, but... Uh, the thing, the thing that's going to to be the most, the thing that's going to get in the way of the casual player the most is just can they understand what's going on in the game? Um, and sometimes that's a matter of does my card read? When I read the card, do I know what it do, does? That's not usually the hard part. Usually the hard part is when the board has like twenty units on the board and they all have abilities that interact with each other. And then you're like, okay, if I do this, then these three things happen, and then and then what? Um, and so it is. the 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 main thing for me, with regards to that, is simply identifying the things that we want to do, and then communicating that as straightforwardly as possible, and importantly, reusing abilities. Um, for instance, I was a huge proponent. I was I was a huge, huge, huge uh, proponent. I pushed very hard for the idea that search would be a rules term with reminder text. It meant that every time you see the word search, you know what it does. You can learn it once, and then we can just use search a bunch, and that will let us do the things that we want to be able to do in the game in a way that you only need to learn once, and then once you know it, you know it. Um, and similarly. You know, we make a bunch of abilities that say attack with a unit, it gets some stats. Once you learn how those abilities work, now every ability works the same way. It's the same logic behind the idea of a keyword, um, but applied to otherwise unnamed abilities. Uh, so that, and to be really vigilant about how and when abilities interact with each other, so that we can be as clear as possible that this triggering condition is the same triggering condition every time, right? Every on attack happens at a specific predefined time. There aren't six different times in which an on attack ability could happen during an attack, for instance. Uh, when played, when defeated, etc. cetera. Uh, even some of the more complicated ones, we try to be as consistent as possible of like, uh, we have a predefined when a attack ends timing point, right? And, uh, when played versus when you play a unit, eh, that's fundamentally the same timing point. Um, basically, we just try to find the the places where the card abilities are going to have potential complexity and try to standardize it as much as possible. So you really only need to learn the mechanics once. So the 
pillars of good card design, it seems like a lot of this has just kind of come down to good rule design as well. And when a, when the rules are foundationally strong, <laughs> it's easy to sort of lay the bricks and create something cool because they all kind of just snap together like Lego, right? And in this case, what would those pillars of good card design be to you? And you already mentioned a little bit about the fact that you're not hiding power level behind rarity. Uh, to a degree, you've said, you know, uniqueness of of, main, of characters and such might have mm -hmm. a certain amount of that. But ultimately, those pillars of good card design, what does that mean to you? When you're in the lab creating, what are some of those pillars that you sort of lean on? Uh, how many words? Um, how many words are on the card? That's a big one for me. Uh, there have been lots of cards that were designed... And then we play with them and we're like, oh, really, this is what the most interesting part of the card is. And then you just take a hatchet to the rest of the text box. Uh, and similarly, there have been lots of mechanics that I've been like, oh, that's a cool mechanic. Let's try that. And then I sit down with InDesign and I'm like, OK, I'm going to write the reminder text. And then the reminder text is five lines long. And I'm like, OK, this mechanic is not going to work. How can I change it so that I can fit it in three lines of text instead of five? Uh, that's a big one. Um, and also communicating the way that you communicate things with with the way that you present the words on the card. Um, something that I think we did a really good job of, and I, I say that be also because we went out of our way to try to do a really good job of this, uh, is to have, the, have a unified formatting for all of our text. Anytime you see a red bold word, it is a keyword. You can 100% guarantee it will be a keyword or it is referencing a keyword. If you see italicized text, 100% of the time, that's reminder text. If you see bold text, 100% of the time, that's a triggering condition. That defines a triggered ability. If you see brackets, that's a cost, right? Uh, we tried to use text formatting in, a, in as standard a way as possible so that we minimize the number of uh, times for someone to read a word and not understand how it works. So when it comes to that, I mean, you mentioned like the simplicity of the actual card design and the way that you're communicating what the card's supposed to do, keeping that concise and to the point and streamlined. I like that. I think that that's very important because at that point, it's kind of like any, it's like kind of like a, you know, dominoes that fall to the degree where if everything mm -hmm. is the way it's supposed to be and you're never deviating, if you have that kind of consistency, um, Hearthstone is notorious for this and the community is always ready to point out, even to the degree of like, these two cards have the same text. Why is this one on the line and the other one on the line below it? And people go crazy yep. over that. that. I mean, I'm the same way. I'm very much that same way. But that does go miles because that must certainly facilitate when it comes down to when you do get into the weeds in the future sets, I would imagine, where cards do a million things or, or they do become a little bit more convoluted or complex. This should – you're kind of like you know laying the foundation for your – your player base to be educated on, you know, Hey, set one was pretty simple, but when we start to, if you guys get this down, the next step, we can be a little bit more creative because we do have a player base that's educated on how these types of things go. Was that in, in sort of the back of your mind when you're saying like, Hey, we're designing it this way because we plan on doing some, some wild, some wild stuff later. Uh, not necessarily, um, because it is a goal of the game line that every set be an, a potential entry point, right? Because we want everyone... Uh, something that Magic learned many years ago is that if you expect... And we learned a lot with living card games. If you expect someone to go find a product from four years ago because that's the only entry point, they're just not going to play the game instead. Um, they want to play whatever their friends are playing, which is whatever just came out. Uh, that said... Uh, one of the main advantages to having such a simple foundational buttressing system is it means that when we really when we do need to go out of our when we do need to go out of our way to make an exception, we have the we we're not asking too much of you because we were asking so little of you to start with mentally you know cognitively speaking uh, we're we're not leaving ourselves room so that we can get weird later, but we are leaving ourselves room so we have the option to get weird later. Oh, I like that. You know, you know what media source has the problem that you guys are tackling right now that is, it's almost impossible to fix? 
is comic books. As a avid comic book collector for so long and i was like in the weeds in into into this when you have to pick up a like when i got into comic books in the early 2000s like this is pre mcu iron man movie Mm. boom whatever i was really into comic books and i was like i want to read spider-man my favorite character you can't just pick up an issue and without having to do so much it was such a nightmare and they tried to fix it with brand new day and all this stuff and now i'm getting off topic which is what i do but (laughs) i feel like this is something that you might appreciate it's you know like where you you kind of you can't just pull something off the shelf. Whereas you, as a card designer, as a set designer, that's an experience that you want to do. You you can you can get into Star Wars U at set seven and feel just as comfortable drafting set seven as without having all that backlog. Absolutely, um, and we've even. Uh... I mean, it's also just part of the conceit of a trading card game, and especially a trading card game based on an existing franchise, that like, not each person is going to have some element of Star Wars that's their favorite. And that's that favorite might not be in set one. So maybe they won't get in on set one because they're like, oh, yeah, OK, it's Star Wars, whatever. And then in set five comes along and they're like, wait, but that's my favorite part of Star Wars. And now they're in. Right. And we don't want to force them to have to go back to the stuff that they're less excited about just to learn the game. I love it. I love it. That's great. Um, so let's talk otherwise from, you know, we talked about good card design, but there's going to be some lines that you understand. Like, it's not just about staying within the, you know, within the lines here uh, or, or within the margins, but like, what are those boundaries that when you are designing, you mentioned what you aim for, but there's got to be some out of bound scenarios where you and the other designers are going to sit there and say, we never cross this line or we don't, uh, we're not going to, you know, explore this aspect of card gaming. And for example, I would say something along the lines of like instant speed effects. And this is something that b- baked into the rules of Star Wars U, it's almost impossible to do that or it's not something that you can do. Same thing with like, a, a, a one turn kill an OTK scenario of combo mm. related. What are those lines in the sand uh, within the designer room for star Wars? You, uh, my personal may, uh, one of my personal big lines I've already said is how many lines of reminder text go with a, go with a mechanic. Um, the rule is if it, if it requires more than three lines of reminder text on a, on our lower density, you know, larger text size, if it's more than three lines, you're out. Not even, not even considering it. Uh, with regards to um, play style stuff, like what you described, uh, it's more of a team side of things, and it's not so much a hard limit as it is a danger zone. Um, anything that gets cards out of the discard pile to play them again is a big danger zone. Uh, anything that uh chains multiple actions together is a danger zone um anything that draws cards at too efficient a rate is a danger zone and all of these are subjective right like if i have a five cost event that returns a unit from my discard pile to my hand that card's fundamentally not playable in any competitive sense so it's probably fine um whereas if i had a zero cost event that said take three actions that's definitely not fine <laughs> yeah. um and so rate does matter quite a bit uh but that said uh, and so that's why it's more of a danger zone than a hard hard boundary right um and we can make exceptions to these things these are as i said these are all danger zones not necessarily you know immediate eject button zones we can have cards that get cards out of the discard pile. We can have cards that chain actions together. We can have cards that, uh, that, uh, I don't remember what the third one was. Um, well, there's the, the, you know, like you mentioned, like you said, chaining things together and such like that. And just any, to any degree of, I suppose, circumventing the rules, but it's like a card that allows you to temporarily break the rules to a degree, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, and that's the premise of a of a trading card game, right? Is that every card breaks some rule somewhere. Um, but we want to make sure that we are breaking that when we break the rules that tend to cause uh, have historically caused problems in other games, we do it with as much testing as possible and 
with as many safety nets as possible, right? Uh, if we're gonna make a card that just says take three actions, you bet we're gonna we're we're gonna design it at the beginning of playtest, and if if it survives to end of playtest, that's because it got the whole playtest period or whatever. Uh, and we probably have other cards that that then have some kind of counter to that. I don't know what that would look like, but we'll see. Um, you get my point that like when we when we take informed risks, they are informed risks, uh, and otherwise we don't take those risks, frankly. So that's definitely a, you know a great thing again, like circumventing the rules as a card being baked into the you know cards are meant to break rules. I think it's a very fascinating take on card design and such, but being careful with it. You mentioned the term risk, which is some might kind of balk at and others might be like hell yeah let's do that because i think that <laughs> if you're not taking risks if you're not you know sort of just sort of dancing the line you said i've got hard lines in the sand in terms of what we can and can't do and i'm good with that but at the same time if you're not kind of sort of walking up to that line and sniffing over the fence a little bit you get a little less inspired and you kind of eventually will you'll run out of real estate within the the the, the boundaries that you have uh, but it's good to know that this isn't something where you guys are just absolutely hard pressed with the you know flag in the sand saying we do not deviate from this radius. I'm glad that there's a lot of ambition there, and that's one thing that I want to ask you about is that with ambition comes incredible ideas, but it also comes with some absolute horrid ones. And um, without throwing anyone under the bus necessarily, I always love to ask game designers what one of the worst designs proposed uh, ever bubbled up for consideration within the design process. There's going to be some wacky ones, some some that are like, well, maybe down the line, but some where you're like, God, no. But like, let's just erase this from memory. It's interesting, but man, is that a silly idea. Uh, that's that's a hard question to answer because I'm the one who usually has the weirdest, most out there, most insane ideas. Uh, that's fine. I mean, it could be you. You could jump on this sword yourself here. I would love to hear some of the Tyler Parrot weirdest and most, you know, the oddities that you have sort of thrown out there because that is one thing that I love to do uh, on Ice Cave with, with Doa and Charmer, which is just – speculate or or just sort of um you know theory craft some weird nonsense that we know is just absurd to the max doa is obsessed with pod racing charmer wants to build a death star <laughs> i want a jedi test like stupid stuff like that i want to know what those tyler parrot ideas were that bubbled up that you're like we'll put this in the vault for now well because here's the thing right is that like i don't actually think any of them are bad designs or i wouldn't have suggested that <laughs> But they definitely were really out there. Um, without getting, without acknowledging any specifics, uh, there have been some allusions to a previous design for Grand Admiral Thrawn that we were testing early on in design. Um, I won't say exactly what the mechanic is because who knows what we might do in the future. But like, it involved requiring people to to take notes and then and then reference those notes and you know reveal what they had written that because it was hidden information. Um, it was a whole separate mini game, basically. Uh, and then um, another one, my favorite design in step one that didn't make it to, to print was an earlier draft of the ghost, uh, which does have a spiritual successor in a future set. So I'm happy that we got there. Uh, but it was, it was one that I felt very strongly about. And the other two team members were like, this is such an open-ended can of worms that there is no world in which we can allow this in just the first set. I was like, but it's cool. <laughs> uh, and my, so there is a, there's one that I have recently designed that we, we just concluded couldn't fit in year three. So I'm going to try to make it fit in year four. That involves multi part card nonsense. Uh, not in a like meld BFG sense, but in a like, you know, you get the cards together and then they become good. And by good, I mean, Wow, good. Uh, <laughs> All right, so two things I want to pull out of this. The first one is the th your th the initial Thrawn concept you're talking about. It gives me nightmares of a particular magic card you might know, like called Goblin Game, uh, where these like mini games. Oh, it, it was worse than Goblin Game, but also better than Goblin Game. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that in itself, Tyler, is just part of the the mental chaos that I cannot wait to see down the line. And this is the second thing that you mentioned that uh, I want to pull out, where you're talking about, well, maybe not for the year three, but we can maybe fit it in for year four. What that tells me is just it just inspires confidence in the fact that you, you and FFG and everybody designing Star Wars U is, are already into the year three, year four process of planning. And, um, you know, this is something that a lot of, of, of people have sort of just kind of been a little bit weary when it comes to, uh, to, to FFG in the game. But I think that that is in itself something that is very inspiring is that, it's not just a matter of, we'll see how this goes. It's, and I mean, I was privy to these conversations when I met you guys in Minneapolis for a while and spoke to the design team. The confidence exuded from that group in that weekend was overwhelming and very reassuring. And the fact that this is something you guys just kind of say, you know, casually mention because it's not even a matter of you guys needing to hammer that home that you're thinking of this far into the future. It's just that, no, we're, we're, we're already... We've already started, you know, pouring the pouring the cement, uh, you know, for those types of years. We're already encroaching on year four planning and such. That that's got to feel good. It feels good for me. It's got to be feel good for you guys as well. Flake, I have so many ideas. <laughs> they cannot be stopped. Oh, I don't want you to stop them. And this is what I'm hoping, Tyler, is that you and I, okay, just between you and I. We can get, you know. You and me and the entire internet. Yeah, yeah, I see how this Nobody's works. here but us, man. Okay, look, <laughs> they're hearing this in the future. We're talking about right now Rude. Tyler and Flake. That's a, that's a good pairing, but we'll talk about it later Rude. because I know that we're, we're currently recording this. Uh, it is April 2nd. It is um, a shade before 6 p.m. Eastern time. In maybe 20 hours from now, I believe you guys have a um, – there's an FFG live stream concerning – design the features things like that you said that there's some spicy bits i saw your tweet don't lie about it i saw your tweet you said yeah, there's yeah. you might want to tune in it's going to be delicious i promise My without it's pretty good that's pretty good this this episode will drop approximately three hours prior to that so for those who are listening to this prior to that live stream i do want to say go no, to the live okay. stream yeah you should do that and maybe is there a breadcrumb you could drop Maybe a little towards that gingerbread house of deliciousness that you guys are going to drop on us in a few hours. What what can we look forward to for that stream? Uh, I'm going to put a put a bounty on the contents of that of that live stream. A bounty. Whoever gets it first gets it. I'm okay. not going to tell you what it is. But All right. There's a bounty. There's a bounty out. Okay. Go find it. All right. Well. After this wraps up, we're gonna you're gonna be inundated with messages from me. I want bounty. <laughs> uh, all right, I've got a question here. Uh, essentially, it's inspired. Well, it's from uh, it's from Doa, who's a big Legends of the Five Rings fan as well, and he asks, uh, uh, "Did your time on L Five R influence your approach to Star Wars? You, I have never played L Five R. I know that Doa, who wishes he could be here, uh, wanted to get this question in. So." Where is the L5R influence when it comes to Star Wars Unlimited? Uh, the L5R influence is heavily in the back and forth action system. And although I didn't have a direct hand in that being the mechanic of this game, uh, obviously L5R is the same deal. Um, the uh, the main one for me is simply the idea of of... One of the lessons I learned from L5R as a game designer was that L5R was trying to be several games at once. Um, and so one of the takeaways that has informed my game design of this game is to really identify what makes Star Wars Unlimited special, what makes it fun, and really focus on that. And don't uh, don't try to get distracted with like, yeah, but what if we made Star Wars Unlimited but Netrunner? No, 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 no. If you want to play Netrunner, go play Netrunner. If you want to play Star Wars, you're going to play Star Wars. Um, and then the, uh, and then I, I I mentioned it in a in a tweet when I talked about confiscate. But the idea of like there are certain even even if you even though you have a color pie, you do still want every action or in this case every aspect to be able to engage with all of the parts of the game. Um, you don't want to have any one action be so much better at the thing that the other colors don't get to participate 
don't get to participate in that part of the game at all. Um, and now that isn't true in set one, because how can it? There's only 250 cards. But as the as the card pool grows, you will see uh, red will get more access to control. Red and yellow will get more access to control. Blue and green will get more access to aggro. Uh, certain things that are currently feel like they are defining certain uh, aspects. The aspects aren't going to become any di more diluted as an identity, but they are going to have more tools for a greater diversity of decks so that if you want to play a certain style of deck, you are not locked into a certain aspect or aspect pair. I like to hear that because I mean, we look at red, there's like power failure and, and uh, fang fighter and things like that, but there's always the confiscate if you want to defeat an upgrade or something like that. Right. And that that's definitely something that I think I was a little bit concerned about. And I might be echoing the sentiments of people out there as well, is that as much as people want certain color identities to be strong, they also want to have access to some of the things. I mean, I, you know, if you're, if we're thinking about this from a magic perspective, there's very much, uh, a very strict identity when it comes to things. And yes, there's there's other ways to do it to a degree. Like in Star Wars U, if you want to defeat a unit, you can either play takedown or you can play open fire on it. But they're two different methods to get to the same thing, right? Um, you know, whether it's... And, and, and importantly, the counterplay to each is different. So like, if I want to remove your unit and I'm in red, then your counterplay to my red removal is different than your counterplay to my blue removal or my yellow removal or whatever. And that's f perfectly fair. And that's part of what I like about this game. And I'm very glad that you did clarify the fact that we're not, we're not going to dilute this to the point where everything just becomes more or less the same. That that uh, I think that aspects have to have strengths and certain weaknesses much like every other card game otherwise why are you why would you play anything else otherwise you're just taking what's the strongest unit i can play or what's the strongest swing play and then i'll just build towards that you, there has to be shortcomings to each of those and um i'm glad that that is uh definitely on the radar and uh you guys have done an exceptional job up to you know in this first set of really putting setting the foundation of what those co that color pie should look like. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. And that's that's awesome for me. I've, I've, from the L5R umbrella of questions, <laughs> I have no idea what this means. So I'm going to just read it as it was typed out, which is... Yeah, yeah, I know this question. This is for you, Doa. <laughs> who's the unicorn clan of set one decks? The hell does that mean? <laughs> uh, the answer to the question is Harris and Dilla. And the reason for that is the Unicorn Clan was famously a fan favorite faction, but was wildly underpowered in the first or the first two thirds of the game's lifespan. Um, now, that's not to say that Hera is as obscenely underpowered as the Unicorn Clan was, because in the case of the Unicorn Clan, it was egregious. Uh, but uh, Hera is a design is is a not expected to be at this point competitive strength. Like we do not expect her to be winning tournaments. It would be cool if she did, but I don't expect it. Um, because she is one of the most popular, at least was internally, one of the most popular casual leaders, full stop, in the whole set. Uh, like, of the people who just wanted to play with their favorite characters, Hera is one of the most popular ones. Of the people that wanted to win tournaments, they weren't picking Hera, but that's fine. Because there were, there are 17 other leaders to choose from, right? Um, and... Just like the Unicorn Clan, she's not siloed into being that forever, but it is important, it is both important and inevitable that some leaders are going to be stronger or weaker than others. So for the weaker ones, making sure they do have an audience of people who passionately are excited about them, despite the fact that they are not tier one competitive, uh, or maybe because them being tier one competitive is irrelevant, uh, is important because it means that Every every card has someone that loves them. It's a very, Era has a lot of someone's that loves them, just not the competitive players. That's a very beautiful way to put it, Tyler. I don't know how else to explain it. It's a very nice and cozy way of putting it. I I have been saying this for a while. I said that I think that obviously Hera Hera's the one that requires the most specific tools to be good. However, in the first set, like you mentioned this earlier, you can't just print everything for everybody just yet. However, Hera does have access to pretty much every color pie without a from a, a character perspective within the specter yep. uh clan tag but 
I said, I said, I said, if anybody's gonna get a boost, the more sets that are get printed, it's gonna be her and Palpatine. That's just what I said. <laughs> I, like, wait a minute, you just wanted to talk about Palpatine. <laughs> I kind of just wanted to talk about Palpatine, and um, this wasn't in the notes, but I do want to sort of just maybe wedge in a little bit of a question regarding the meta and your um, your sort of initial thoughts about it because. We just did an episode last week that was a commentary on um, the uh, on Boba Fest 2024, which was essentially this one major tournament where the top eight was all Boba Fets. And I was in very much the the hey, pitchforks down, calm your calm yourselves. The game is still within a, a in major flux. Everything is just completely chaotic right now. Things will settle. People will find their niche. People are also getting better at the game. Is the meta as it stands right now, which is you've got your Boba Fett kind of creeping up and such like that. Obviously, there's going to be winners and losers. And how have you, sorry, um, the meta as it stands right now versus your initial expectations when the game launched. You said, all right, after a month, this is what I think it's going to look like. Versus those expectations, how has it sort of matched up? Um, Boba came out stronger than we expected. Uh, I we are surprised that there are not as many Palpatines uh, as we expected to see. That's because I'm not playing um, these tournaments, dude. That's why. Because you're not playing these tournaments, <laughs> my dude. Uh, although I will say that um, Aiden has been doing a pretty good job carrying the expected Palpatine flag, and Krennic has been way higher up in the tier list than we expected, which is frankly cool. Um, cool to me, anyway. Uh. We expected more Sabine and Le and Leia, but we also expected less Boba Fett. And frankly, Boba Fett beats Hera and Sab or not Hera, uh, Leia and Sabine. So it makes sense if everyone's going to be playing Leia and Sabine, then you play Boba Fett to beat Leia and Sabine, and then you don't see Leia and Sabine anymore. You see all the Boba Fetts. Um, and then eventually you play Aiden and Palpatine to beat Boba Fett, and then we all go back to Sabine, and you get your little circle, right? Um, that's what we expect. We'll see what actually happens. Yeah. Uh, like you said, I do not put very much weight in the results of one tournament that that happened three weeks after the game launched. Uh, I think that there is a significant amount of space for player creativity and innovation and uh, and exploring the card pool to happen before we all agree that Boba Fett is a menace, even though he is a little bit of a menace. Just a slight little menace, but um, <laughs> I'm like I said, I'm just waiting and just licking my chops to go ahead and, and, and sort of fire off some of these more competitive tournaments. And the beauty of this is, again, it, while I'm waiting to sort of attend those, you know, those SCG Con 5Ks or whatever the hell else it is, the, in the meantime, I'm just going to the locals and, yeah. have, and, and having fun playing that and just being amidst the communities and what's cool about it is that the last one I went to I brought Palpatine because that's it's my boy and that's my pet project and that's what I want to be playing until I can sort of work on it and such but ultimately it was a matter of hey I, I got I played a lot of close games I lost I, I think across all the games I was like four and four and I had a good time and that's what's important and the people who won and the people who lost had the exact same expression on their face because the game is good because they were Yay. winning and having fun and they were losing and having fun. So, I love that so much. um, you know, this is going to come off and sound like completely like uh, a fanboy shill move, but you guys made an exceptional game and there had to be a certain amount where you're like, well, we're definitely going to appeal to a lot of the star Wars fans in the card game. But what you said earlier of if you want to play Netrunner, play Netrunner. If you want to play this, play this. And I think that when people looked at a star Wars card game, they're like, are like you're using this IP, but why don't you use this IP for a, an existing rule set? And you guys have not just bucked that and said we're doing something new, but you created something new that's also very good. So I want to congratulate you guys on this and all of FFG, um, because there was a pretty significant barrier to kind of crush through to say, hey. We've got we've got a, a we've got to win back some trust perhaps, but we're going to do it in the best way possible. And that to me has always been make a good game, and that's what you guys have done. So well done on that. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna be honest. Um, 
I was expecting people to, air quotes, come around to the game uh, once they played it. Um, because there was a lot of, listen, there were a lot of reasons for people to not give our game a chance. Whether it was the company's reputation, whether it was the the history of this, of Star Wars card games, whether it was the similarity to other games that existed on the market. Um, and I always knew that once you get the game in someone's hands, then they'll get it and understand why it's so fun. Uh, the conversion rate has been like 98% or something insane. Like, I knew people would come around once they played the game. I wasn't expecting basically everyone to come around when they played the game. Uh, so that's heartening to see. <laughs> like, all you got to do is get it into someone's hands and then... A week later, they're trying to buy a box. Like, it's wild. That's what happened to me. I, I've got uh, friends who are diehard Flesh and Blood players and, perfect, and and pros, and they were attending Gen Con, the initial, you know, learn to play or mm. whatever. And I said, listen, can you do me a favor? I know you guys are there for other reasons, for, you know, other card games or whatever. Can you just go and score me the, the Luke Invader? Oh, I, the Luke Invader promise. Yeah, sure. I said, please do it. And then at the end of it, they showed me that they got like three or four copies of it because they kept going back in line to play it over and over again because they loved it so much. And they sure. said, they're like, I, I think we're going to get in on this. And <laughs> that, no, 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 no. I want to, I want to, I want to give you the accolade here. You bamboozled your friends into being fans of this game and you did a great job of it. <laughs> uh, yes. Look, I'm just saying, if, if you. No, no, no. That's exactly the right attitude because, <laughs> because like, There is, uh, people don't know what they're going to like until they try it. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, sometimes a little friendly bamboozling gets you there. Well, you know, like the carrot on the stick aspect, sometimes it's, you know, you catch more flies with honey kind of thing. And, and I told yeah, them, I said, like, listen, I'm like, they, they may have owed me some favors. And I just, <laughs> said, I said, listen, I, you know, I'm like, I don't even know if you had to play the learn to play sort of demo in order to get the cards. Right. All I said was, I'm like, just go. You have to play the game. You have to play at least one game and then you get the cards. And then they were like, hey, I got like four copies because like this game is amazing. This game rocks. Yeah. But but the the community aspect and the push of this, I think you guys at FFG must realize that those people who went to those demos and tried it, they were the ones who were in the ear of their LGS is saying, you have to carry this. Like you have to get in on this. And I'm gonna I'm not and I'm not saying that I'm responsible or someone else specifically was responsible obviously for the growth of this game or whatever, but like just me locally, I'm friends with a lot of good um LGS owners here in Toronto. And many of them were like not touching it, not touching it at all. And then eventually once you know, there was hype being built about it, and I wouldn't shut the hell up about it. Then they're like, <laughs> we're going to place an order for product, but we're not running a pre-release. Then they run a pre-release, and that sells out multiple times over. Then they start carrying product. Then they start running yep. weeklies. Like you said, it's a try it and see. This isn't a matter of us saying, try it, you're going to like it. It's try it, you might like it. And I think that that is a very cool approach, and a lot of this has to be I mean, you guys must have had all the confidence in the world to say, we made something good. We're going to let the community kind of light the fires on this. Well, and it was a it was a strategic intent to not sell this game in, you know, your Targets and your Walmarts and your Amazons. We specifically went out of our way to say, this game, when it launches, will be sold in local game stores where people will go to play games and support their community. Because as you said... Without a community, there isn't a game. Um, and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. We're going to try to help the community support each other, you know, so that everyone can get on board. boy, I like it. All right. Well, Tyler, we've got one more segment left. It's a little rapid fire action. I haven't named this segment yet. I don't know what the hell to call it. I usually take either a concept. Maybe it's the ambush. I don't know. Maybe we'll call this the right, ambush. Let's shoot from the hip. Shoot from the hip. Yes. Yes. Let's shoot from the hip. Are you ready to shoot from the hip, Tyler? I'm armed and dangerous. <laughs> you okay. can't see me making finger guns right now. Let's go. Rapid fire questions here. You can elaborate as much as you want. Short answers also accepted. I'm going to ask you this, man. It's right up there in your Twitter profile bio. You love Halo. I'm all for it, man. 
best two weapon combo in Halo? Plasma rifle and another plasma rifle at the same time. What? I will also I will also accept in my back pocket an energy sword to go with my two plasma rifles. I will also accept uh, the I think it's a plasma carbine or a pulse carbine or whatever the new one in Infinite is that shoots burst fires. Mm -hmm. That and a commando where you you double tap someone with the plasma weapon to strip their shields and then you headshot them with the with the the, the commando. Okay, so those are my. Those are my two. Those are my two lineups that I go for. <laughs> what? So uh, look, I'm a Halo Three guy through and through. Um, I think it's like one of the epitomes of top tier competitive fun team based playing I've ever had in my entire life. If you're not on top of the the sniper tower on the pit with a sniper and a shotgun or an energy sword, are you really truly degenerate? I don't think so. That is the true number one. It's an energy... Flake, Flake, Flake. Yes. You assume I can hit someone with a sniper rifle. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty good. I've been playing exclusively on PC my whole life. I'm pretty good, but even I'm not that good. (laughs) Do you still play Infinite? Oh, yeah. Okay, so... True story. I... I uninstalled it as recently as five days ago because nobody would play with me. I used to play it all the time, and I have nobody to play with. So you give me the word, I'll fire that bad boy back up. You got it. Uh, Yeah, I played it a bunch when it came out, and then I uninstalled it for several months, and then they added a whole bunch of content, and then I got back into it, and it was great. Anyway, next. All right, strongest aspect currently in Star Wars Unlimited. This is not necessarily an objective thing. It's purely opinion of yours. Strongest aspect currently in Star Wars Unlimited? Correct. Uh, man. Currently. What will be the strongest aspect when set two drops? Cunning. Cunning. Ooh, love to hear it. Tyler, who inspires you? My dad. That's a good answer. All right. Fast food guilty pleasure, Tyler. I don't know if it's guilty, uh, but Raisin Cane's? I get Raisin Cane's on a, like a weekly basis because well, since they open it up next to the office, it's my go-to lunch spot. Oh, Cane's is a chicken place, is it not? We don't yes. have it in Canada. Okay, so there I know this. I went, to Ra- I went to Cane's. I was brought there by my friend Jordan Kennedy. We drove past there. Uh, we went in. I am a big fan of coleslaw. I was strong-armed and, frankly, bullied into not getting the coleslaw, into getting what they said was the best toast ever. I was unhappy. They have said uh, – I they, they told me that after I was denied my coleslaw, I moped for two hours, which is true, and I was cranky flake. But the chicken was okay. I'm not going to – I'll just say it's okay. They have, a, they have a sauce that is unique to them that I go for with my chicken. Okay, now, now we're talking. Sauce is like – which is why Cane specifically. Otherwise, it's it's just chicken otherwise, right? Bread, yeah. chicken, whatever. I mean, any food, frankly, is just a vessel for sauce. Like, that's all it is. It's a, <laughs> delivery. It's a sauce delivery system. We're okay with that. How do you think I have rice with so many dishes? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tyler, here's the scenario. It's uh, We're having a massive tournament, okay? You're in the top eight. Uh, the okay. stadium is packed. The lights go down. You're, you're ready to fire up your, your match. The lights go down. What music starts playing for your walkout? For me to walk out of the room? Well, no, to walk down to the ring and play the game. Like your oh, walkout that music. that walkout music. Yeah, like, you know, like, you know, WWE yeah, yeah, wrestling, yeah, yeah, yeah. that okay, kind of stuff. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, I guess technically it is also your, like, walk out of the room music, too, when you win. no, no. no. Uh, my 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 walk into the ring music is probably hailstorm. Okay, which is a which is a hard rock band. I'm in. Sounds good to me. So, twenty, thirty, forty years down the line from now, Star Wars U has released you know 105 sets. It's exceptionally super super important and popular within the you know pop culture and and culture in general. Okay. It's been entered into the Smithsonian. It's 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 <laughs> culturally relevant. They decide to make a movie. Who plays Tyler Parrot in the in the movie in the Star Wars Unlimited movie? Uh, 
My personal preference, even though he does not look like me, is Daniel Radcliffe because that boy is a gem. <laughs> That's a good one. That is a good one. Um, all right. So similar to the previous question, actually, is um, you've won that match, Tyler. You're going to go. You won the championship. You're going out for karaoke. What hey, is the What is the first thing that you punch into the request line for your karaoke song? Uh, I want it that way by the Backstreet Boys. Oh, legend. Absolute <laughs> legend. <laughs> Oh my god. Every time I travel for a tournament we go to karaoke, I try to round up people. I say, "Friends, I need some I need some boy band members here. I am JT. Yeah. I need a I need a Chris Kirkpatrick. I need a, a Joy <laughs> Fatone. I need a Lance Bass. Like I, where are and like that is always it. Team together. Yes, you need it. So, I'm so glad that you said that because that is now canon and so now, it's, yeah. When we go to a tournament together, Afterwards, you know what we're doing. But who, which, which Backstreet Boys your favorite? Uh oh boy, that's a. I, I'm I I don't know that I'm going to be able to answer that question in the year of 2024 because it's been a long time since I thought about the individuals in that band. Yeah, some uh, some of them have been doing some pretty greasy stuff over time. I gotta let you know, but yeah, yeah. I think the safest bet, frankly, AJ McLean. AJ McLean. Sure. Yeah, yeah. He's 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 been chill, right? Yeah. I think he's. Okay, I great. think he's been perfectly fine. He's not got got nothing bad going on in his life. I think he's fine. I'll take it. I'll All take right. it. I'll take the suggestion. <laughs> All right. This is a hot button topic for me and one of my favorite casting partners in uh, Flesh and Blood. Mm. We uh, we have we are very much butting heads over this one. We always put it to a poll. There's always hundreds and hundreds of people who weigh in on this. Skittles or peanut M and M's. <sighs> I was gonna say M and M's, and then you had to go say peanut. Okay, well, if it's an well, well, the original the original way I wrote it down was Skittles or M and M's. You can qualify okay. a particular type of M M&M and M if you want, or a particular type of Skittle, even though they all taste the same. It's up to you. Uh, I'm on Team M and M's uh, because Skittles are too sweet. They are just pure sugar, and my body can't handle that. Whereas chocolate at least has more than zero percent bitterness, even if it is close to zero percent because it's milk chocolate. Uh, that said, I have a I don't dislike peanuts, but I I don't want them most of the time. So, <laughs> um, this was completely obviously an opinion related question piece, but you aced it. You absolutely oh. aced it, especially on the Skittles or M and M's. I'm gonna studied, flip that part and send it to my friend DM Armada, who uh, is a Skittle fiend idiot. What is he thinking? Skittles are just stale, dried up gum. And that's How? all it is. How can his body subsist with that much with that much raw sugar just poured into it? That's like that's like pixie sticks. That's just like you're just sugar in your mouth and there's mm -hmm. nothing else. There's no no uh, no no uh, no subtlety. A lot of the candy <laughs> options of us growing up in the '90s. I'm I'm yeah. imagining you and I yeah. are more or less close yeah. to the same age. Was all yeah. just different forms of how they just delivered pure sugar to you. That's all it was. Colored sugar. No, no, specifically brightly colored sugar. Yes. Yeah. Like those, remember those like dip sticks or whatever, where it's just like, okay, take a, 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 a sugar stick and dip it in powdered yep. sugar yep. and then yep. consume. That's all it was. Yep. Pixie it was. sticks, my God. Oh my Lord. Dear. dear. All right. That said, <laughs> this Tyler. Is gonna become the, this has become the 90s culture podcast if you're not careful. <laughs> that's what I'm aiming for, my friend. I'm just waiting for somebody to be like, that's the guy we need to talk about Fresh Prince of Bel-Air for two hours. Like, yeah, yeah let's do let's it. <laughs> Tyler, you're a legend. I really appreciate your time, my friend. Um, obviously, like I mentioned, uh, on um, April 3rd, I believe it's at 2 p.m. Central Time is the live stream. 1 p.m. Central. 1 p.m. Central Time. My bad. 1 p.m. Central Time. 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on April 3rd. If you guys are listening to this just before that, right after you shut this down, go there. Go watch it. And if you're late, go now. You can always catch me <laughs> Tyler, you're a legend. I really, really appreciate you, my friend. Yeah, this is great. I love Ted. Beauty. Uh, anything you want to sort of let us, uh, let us in on before you go? Any last-minute sort of mic drop moments that'll... Oh no! Nothing I say could nothing I could say could rival tomorrow. Okay. Wow. That that in itself is a mic drop moment. All right, friends. As always, thank yeah, you so you much. You gotta tune in. You gotta tune in tomorrow. Now's your chance. Oh God! They're pulling me away. <laughs> we could try to put some really. Cool, I don't have the the production budget to do something cool with you, but I'll see what I could do. <laughs> Just like have you poof explode or something. Thank you, Tyler. 
uh, and everyone else listening, you guys rock. Thank you very much. Be kind to one another. We'll catch you next time on Hello There. So uncivilized. <laughs>